Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the beginning of CEA Open League playoffs. Today marks the beginning of the round of 36. And personally, I'm really excited because now we're going to get a little bit more competitive matches as all of these teams have fought tooth and nail through the first seven weeks of the season. And everything is culminating up to this point. I'm CDAPS, joined by Bagel. And we're going to be getting an absolute treat today as we are seeing Case Western Reserve University go against Penn State Academy. Yeah, I'm really excited to see this one. As you were saying about it being playoffs now, there's a lot more on the line um, for these teams going forward. The top eight teams from these playoffs will actually have a chance to make it into the invite league next season. So for these teams, there's a lot riding on these matches and they're going to try maybe just a little bit harder than they were during the regular season for us. Yeah, and definitely we're also having a shift. And if you did notice, all of our games before this were best of twos. But now we've gone ahead and thrown another wrinkle, and there will be the decider map. So these are technically a best of three. So speaking of those, we will be starting tonight on Cafe, going to Coastline, and the decider map will be consulate if it is needed. Yeah, I'm really excited to see Cafe. We've been seeing a lot of Cafe play recently um, from a lot of these teams, but I know it's a map that Penn State has kind of shied away from during the regular season. Not that they went out of their way to get rid of it um, from their play, but they did ban it a few more times than they banned any other map. So we'll see if they have anything prepared special for us on this one. Maybe low quality. Their coach has prepared something for them to work with here. Yeah, and hopefully they, those strats won't be low quality indeed. But Cafe is one of those maps that does tend to be a little bit more defender-sided. But recently, as the couple games I've casted, we have seen a bit more of a shift towards possibly a 3-3 as opposed to the direct every single time you see at least a 4-2 or a 5-1 split. So I'm definitely excited to see exactly how these teams are going to structure their attacks and try to get as many rounds as they can. Yeah, exactly. I think... You're you're very right in saying that um, we've shifted more towards 3-3 three, three being an average uh, half. I think it, it has to do with the attackers have been getting a little bit more risky uh, across the board. They've just been taking more gunfights, putting more pressure on, and like si yeah, figuring out how to systematically clear out the uh, cafe from, from all angles. Yeah, and it's definitely one of those maps. There's three floors, and there's a whole lot of destructibility and a lot of vertical play you can see. So if you're able to get any sort of top-down control, clear out your roamers, start blasting away at the floor, you can really make those anchors that are sitting on site get a little bit more, a little bit more anxious, feel a little bit more endangered, and possibly force some mistakes to happen. Yeah, definitely. Making those anchors feel trapped is very, very important for these teams to be able to accomplish successfully. There's not a lot of good places to sit an anchor on some of these sites. Um, third floor has a, a good amount of anchor positions, but the other sites, you need to be a little more creative uh, to anchor effectively. Um, so if the attackers are able to formulate a solid plan and put that necessary pressure onto those anchors, it, we could be in for some interesting kill-heavy rounds. Yeah, and speaking of kill-heavy, we can go ahead and talk a little bit about map two, which will be coastline. I like to call it the Dust 2 of Rainbow Six Siege. If you're a little bit of a Counter-Strike fan, maybe that was a little bit of your background. That's definitely going to be a really frag-heavy map that I think will be definitely exciting. So make sure to stay tuned in for map 2, because at least these two maps will be guaranteed. We don't necessarily know if we're going to be going to Consulate, depending on how either of these teams performed. Hopefully we will, because I think that's an absolute treat. You know, when you get all the way down to your do-or-die map, it's always going to be good content. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually ended up seeing Consulate. Uh, even though these teams are from different divisions, they're very similar 
um, in their records with the two of them only having a round differential separated by one round. Penn State coming in with a 28-round differential and Case Western coming in with a 27-round differential, which actually is going to play a, a role in our decider match because at CEA we decide uh, the side choice based off of your overall round differential. So Penn State, even though they have a, a worse overall record, they have less points than Case Western, because they have that round differential advantage, they will be able to pick what side they start on if we do end up seeing that decider map. Yep, and speaking of the sides, I guess we can go ahead and talk about the rosters, as Case Western will be comprised of a Tango Mango Down, a Semineo, Tim the Consuela, Noxious Leon, and Levent, and Penn State will be comprised of Pufferfish Boy, Soma, Jumpy Guy, McNutt, and K-Bear. Yeah, I'm excited to see specifically what we get out of K-Bear on the side of Penn State, especially on Coastline. They've had a a pretty good season as far as kills go. They've been fragging out pretty heavy. Their KD up to this point is a 1.53, which is significantly better than anyone else on their team. And since Case Western has decided to not play with uh, their biggest fragger, Orion. I think we might see the a lot of the gunfights go in the way of Penn State here. Yeah, and I know I think the person to watch on Case Western will be Tango Mango Down. He is a one of our members of our statistics team, so you know we got to have a little bit of love in our hearts for those people behind the scenes making all of these wonderful statistics we're bringing for you happen. I have had the pleasure of casting one Case Western map. And I did believe it was Coastline. I do believe. And they definitely do a good job in a lot of the ways that they structure their attacks, structure their defenses. They do seem really organized and well put. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't aware that um, Tango Mango was a part of our stats team, but have knowing that now, yeah, I would expect some pretty, pretty calculated plays coming out from him and some advanced knowledge of this game. You don't, you don't take stats in the game as long as he has and not pick up any special knowledge. Oh yeah, when you're when you're looking at all these beautiful numbers behind the scenes, you can really Siege is a game of information, it's a mental game as well as your physical mechanics and that's I think the beauty of it. You know, you have to be almost just as much a brain as aim in order to be successful. Yeah, exactly. And specifically when you're in a more competitive setting like this where you have four other teammates that you can rely on, if you're a player that's focused more on analytics and putting together some cool plays, you have that option to kind of sit back and let the rest of your teammates handle any frags and a lot of the gunfights, and you can focus more on your expertise. Yeah, precisely. And especially all the crazy angles you might be able to open, but all that doesn't matter if you don't use that angle effectively, and you sort of need to funnel in your exact defense where you want it to go. And speaking of that, we will go ahead and be going right into Cafe and getting underway with the bands. I'm interested to see what we get for bands here. I've been seeing a lot of uh, shield bands come out from a lot of these teams, and that's usually just because they don't like playing against shields. Typically, they are kind of annoying to play against. If you have a, a good defensive strategy, they can mess that up and kind of force you to have to rework your whole situation. And that, that isn't something that really anybody wants to have to deal with. Yeah, but the first ban coming out of the Case Western side will be Dokabi. And that's an operator that definitely is very strong in conjunction with the Jackal that we are also seeing banned in getting a really good roam clear. So it does seem as if both of these teams want to have that ability open. They're going to keep their roamers safe as possible and probably trying to get some high octane gameplay and a lot of kills for their team. Yeah, and those two operators specifically can be quite annoying if you have to deal with them consistently and then that first defensive band coming up being a mira not very surprising at all she's one of those operators that no matter what map you're playing on she can be found she has her uses that pretty much nobody wants to have to deal with so we see her get banned out almost always and then the fourth band coming up echo another one just like you really don't want to play against that it's gets down gets really annoying at the end of the rounds and uh, just a band that we see uh, pretty often. 
Yeah, d definitely having an echo ban. He's one of those few operators that can be sitting all the way across the map in a 1v5 situation. They can just blast you with that drone and end the round if we do see those double zeros, or triple zeros, pardon me, if the plant is going down. But speaking of that, we will be going up to the third floor bar cocktail lounge site and seeing a combination, you know, the dual power of the Doc Rook combo, double ACOGs with those MP5s, most likely going to be trying to hold some really long angles, maybe get a little bit cheeky with those Valp cameras that we're seeing Noxious Leon sixth pick on to, trying to maybe get some unsuspecting kills, sort of a surprise factor. Yeah, it's interesting seeing those, like you were saying, the double, the Doc and Rook. There's a lot of long angles that can be held on this map, especially with the amount of play that is dedicated on the outside for the attack. A lot of window repelling towards site and try to gain control that way. So having those two ACOGs on defense is, I imagine will pay off greatly for them. Yeah, and I think the most important part of this third floor defense will be that piano room that you see in the top right of your screen right now. That's now onto the top left after the rotation. You are seeing that is a gigantic choke point in a very powerful position that these defenders are most likely gonna try to hold control of as long as possible to really slow down the attackers and halt their progress as they push in towards site. Yeah, that many of the attacks that we see on this site will come from that side of the map over on the western side, focused primarily around that piano room and trying to push in through there just because there's a lot more options for the attackers and a lot less places for the defenders to to hold any tight angles. Although, I imagine if we see a very solid defensive hold uh, on towards that western piano side, we might see the attackers go shift towards an, an east side push and maybe move up white stairs and around through pillars. Yeah, but unfortunately the action is going to get halted due to some ping issues as Case Western is going to have to use their first rehost due to some ping issues. So, unfortunately, where you're going to be Probably about around five minutes on this rehost as we're going to get the lobby back in and try to make sure that these issues are resolved so these players get the best competitive experience and playing time that they deserve as they've earned. Yeah, it would be pretty tough to play to your full potential with 650 ping. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know. I don't know how good you'd have to be to be able to pull that one off, but I'm not going to have to see it today. <laughs> Yeah, you definitely, we don't play Overwatch over here, so you don't want to be bouncing back in time like Tracer if you ever play that game as well. <laughs> but, so this scoreboard is lying just a little bit as we will be restarting back at 0-0 zero, zero when we come back from break.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We are just getting back into this game after that uh, quick rehost that we had right off the bat. Had some ping issues, but hopefully now we'll be all set and be able to get this game underway. As now we are going to see these teams going back to the exact same site that they set up with the same picks and sixth picks doing because this rehost was called within the prep phase as opposed to the pick phase. So they will be locked into the exact team configurations that they were doing. However, once the round starts, they are free to maybe make a different rotate hole or whatever. We can't really administer all of that going on. But I am definitely excited to see how this third floor bar cocktail defense does start because this is definitely going to try to set the pace for the rest of this match as Case Western is going to try to hopefully get out to a strong little lead as they push forward. Yeah, for Case Western going into their defensive half, we were talking about it earlier. We're seeing a lot of 3-3 three, three, uh, score lines after the first half on Cafe recently, but on your defense, you're going to want to at least go 4-2, set yourself up for success on your attacking round, maybe take a little bit of the stress off at the beginning of those that attacking round for yourself. Yeah, definitely. Third floor is the site that most teams will usually win two times out of their going. It is definitely, in my opinion, the easier site to defend. Then as you go in towards more of the first floor site being kitchen, it's definitely a strong site depending on your exact um, configuration and how you're going to set up the site with your roam presence as such. But then I think the biggest sort of like the decider of this area in map is definitely when you go to the second floor usually that reading room bomb site is definitely the more difficult to defend and that's sort of where everything gets changed out if you're able to win your reading that's sort of is a good indicator on how you're going to take the rest of the map yeah definitely that those second floor bomb sites typically are the the tertiary bomb sites like you were saying for almost every team that we see play and that those sites really emphasize what we were talking about earlier on this map where you're going to have a lot of destructibility and be able to force those anchors into some tight positions they don't want to be in that happens even more so on those second floor sites so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to see some tricky fun little anchor plays but back onto this third floor site we get a little rappel coming out first getting some shots end up mcnutt actually ended up taking the first pick here a nice little headshot on two the rook of Simon, I don't don't even know how to pronounce that. Asimenio? Yep, that's I'm, that's what I'm going with. That's what I'm going yeah. with. <laughs> and that is an opening pick onto the white stairs. And so now Tango Mango Down is definitely going to feel a little bit more pressure as he could get pinched. And the initial shots are going to go out from that white door over towards Mini Cocktail. And he will go ahead and just retreat out as Noxious Leon did get a little aggressive and try to get a repelling player and will get downed as a result. However, the dock is going to be going true to his name and getting that revive onto his teammate and bringing him back into the fight. However, the first impact coming out, or actually I believe that was McNutt or the Ash of K-Bear using a breaching charge to open up the soft wall into bathroom. However, the thermite charge will get removed and now there is no more exothermic charges here. And now speaking of that, Levin will get the initial pick onto the Ash here playing this deep maestro cocktail angle. And with 58 seconds left on the board and no breaching, I think K, um, PSU is PSA. Pardon me, is going to have to get a little bit more aggressive and push forward. But Pufferfish will get another kill onto Livon as Tango Consuela does answer right back and take out Soma. Yeah, we're going to see Tango Mango down on a nice flank there. Unfortunately, not able to capitalize on that positional advantage and gets taken out instead. And then Consuela able to get back one for himself, and we're in a two v two with the bomb plant going down right now. Weird that we still had a Valkam left over there, but, you know, is what it is. And then Mick not able to take down one last one right before Noxious Leon able to get even it right back up. Now with this 1v1 situation with the post plant, it's going to be difficult for Noxious Leon to retake this. going to have to win the gunfight pretty cleanly and make his way over towards this diffuser. Yep, and speaking of that, the Thermite will go ahead and clutch out the round and take a nice shot from Jumpy Guy as he takes down the Valk and takes the first attacking round in for PSA and definitely sending a strong message for the rest of this map as they push forward and continue attacking. Yeah, I want to highlight uh, Tango Mango down on that dock was on a very nice rotation up red stairs onto to be able to get a flank off. Um, but 
and unfortunately wasn't able to win the first gunfight that he was t he took which ended up costing um costing them the round unfortunately if he was able to get that first pick from that flank i think we could have seen a much different result yeah, Doc was able to give some life into Valkyrie and keep him alive for the end of the round. However, was not able to do the other side of that and take the lives away from the attackers. As he was trying to flank, he has a big old beefy three armor and those footsteps definitely propagate up the stairway quite nicely for that flank watch attacker to just sit there and wait for him to walk into his crosshair. Yeah, so like we were saying, you really don't want to lose uh, your third floor defense. But unfortunately, that is what happened uh, for Case Western. So we're going to have to go back for a second try here. And I think what fell apart uh, on this defense in the first round was we were talking about it earlier, the piano hold, they kind of gave up control of that piano room a little bit too early, in my opinion. I think it was if they had ended up holding on to it for a little bit longer than they were able to, I think we could have seen a different round because um, we did see them have full control with a minute and a half left uh, in the round, and that kind of forced the defense back into some uncomfortable positions and wasn't they weren't able to capitalize on any positions that they had available to themselves. Yeah, and I think the biggest part of that was the initial pick onto the pallets of white stairs on Asimio as McNutt was able to get on that rappel and take out the initial gunfight and start the opening fragging for his team. That really made Tango Mango down have to worry about his back and he could have been pinched at any time sort of had to fall back and relinquish that piano control to those attackers but now we are seeing a gridlock this time as pufferfish boy has opted to take a very traditional flank watch operator as soon as she's most likely going to be throwing down those track stingers on red stairs forcing the attack defenders who might want to flank up that stairway to go through those gigantic hexagons of spikiness and make a whole lot of noise that the rest of the attackers will be able to hear yeah, that flank, that flank watch is going to be really important uh, for this attack. I'm going to see Tango Mango getting into a little bit of gunfight over here on towards this pixel angle into Piano. Not able to get anything off of it, not even a little bit of damage, and actually ends up dying. Gets taken down by Jumpy Guy. And now, just like we saw in the first round, they have given up Piano Control with a minute and a half left in the round. So hopefully, they're able to recover from this better than they were able to last time. But we're going to see another... Repelled run out from Noxious Leon, just like the first round, it gets taken out by McNutt. And now into this 3v5 situation, it's looking pretty similar to what we saw last time. Yeah, but with Pufferfish still on the board, that is a bunch of smokes that he can go ahead and throw out and try to get the plant down. But K-Bear is just going to go ahead and run straight into Freezer and get the initial pick onto the Maestro, as well as get in behind a Simeo and take out the Rook. Now, the last player is flanking. It is a Jaeger on wait stairs, and he is flinched as K-Bear goes absolutely crazy and I believe is a 3k and definitely a very strong showing from PSA as they are showing why they picked this map in particular. Yeah, that was a, a great final kill. Uh, it didn't end up coming into play, but uh, if you notice, there was a second attacking operator coming up right behind the Jaeger on those white stairs. So even if K-Bear had lost that fight, we would have seen the Jaeger get taken down pretty quickly right afterwards. It seems to me that Penn State has a pretty good read on the defensive strategies of case western here and yet yeah, it makes sense to me that we're going to see a site switch up maybe try something new hopefully able to get back on their feet and get some momentum rolling on this defensive half yeah and as we're going to kitchen service and kitchen cooking it's definitely a very different bomb site as you are gonna have to have a guaranteed sort of breach denial as a bakery is a very big choke point it's almost the piano of this bomb site here as you're going to most likely be putting those mute jammers actually they're going to go and switch to the band and make me eat my words they're going to be electrifying those walls really slow down the attackers however thatcher has been left on the board due to the dokabi ban so maybe those emp grenades will definitely be a force to be reckoned with as those little blue balls of electronic death can just be thrown out and removing those batteries allowing jumpy guy to get a breach into sight yeah it's interesting to say but we've been seeing a lot more games with a Thatcher ban than without in uh, the recent weeks of competitive play across all levels, really. So having Thatcher on the board does open up to a, a play style that we haven't seen in a little bit where you're, you are able to get rid of those gadgets pretty easily and make your way into a site in a way that the defense doesn't really want you to be able to. So 
we'll see if that those EMPs are able to pay off for them and be used effectively. But if he ends up getting taken down early in the round, yeah, that operator won't be available. That won't that operator won't help them at all. Yeah, and but this, speaking of that, we are seeing the mute and Jaeger go ahead and go upstairs. It's going to force these PSA attackers to probably do a full top down clear unless they're just going to bully their way straight into bakery as they are doing right now they're sort of saying screw the anchor or screw the roamers we can just take sight and force a retake as the initial thatcher grenade is going down in conjunction with these two breaches however it does seem we're gonna see noctis leon getting a little bit of a bandit trick going down however the ash is already getting a little bit aggressive inside of prep and making this bandit sort of have to watch his back as another thatcher grenade is going down in conjunction with this Ash going in, is just going to find the Bandit sitting there idly by. Take the second aim duel, but unfortunately will fall. And Tango Mango will get a kill on to McNutt. As, as Simeo gets another shot onto the Thermite. And it's definitely decimating this PSA attack. Yeah, this is very shocking to me. They're able to win these gunfights. Unfortunately, Tango Mango gets taken out by Kyo Soma there. And now back into a 3v3 situation. With a minute and 43 seconds left in the round, a Semenio able to get one onto K-Bear. And now, just like that, the defense is back in control, and a Semenio actually able to get a triple kill on the round. Maybe we'll see if they're able to go for four, but this is not looking good for Pufferfish Boy. Yeah, he's going to be left in this 1v3 clutch situation, but he does have the diffuser in his hand and a clear access to site. However, his location is most likely known as he's going to throw these track stingers to try to block any sort of rotation here. But these ACOG, the ACOG of a Simeo is going to be prodding around and trying to find the location of this last attacker. But Pufferfish Foy will win his first fight as well as the second on Deleven, putting into a 1v1 situation on this retake. Diffuser's down and he's also going to see the Jaeger and going to clutch out for his team and put PSA in a 3-0 strong attacking start. Wow, Pufferfish Boy really made me eat my words on that one. That was an incredible end of the round play there that we just saw able to take out those three operators in quick succession without really much contention at all usually when you're in a situation like that you're going to want to see your defenders go and attack uh two on one usually like try to get at least have a, an operator in a position to trade but in that round we saw the defense approach puffer fish boy one at a time which allowed that uh, LMG of gridlock to really shine and we saw how just how powerful that gun could be Yeah, in that clutch situation puffer fish boy definitely was able to handle the heat and stayed his way in kitchen Going the clutch, but I do think we can go ahead and talk about that Well, my pick coming out for case Western This is gonna be the first mark and first instance of a illegal Well, my pick in CEA as these operators have been unquarantined for the playoffs so now we are going to get to see he's a very strong operator with a whole lot of utility and definitely works well as a jaeger supplement so maybe they felt as if the utility use of psa was just a little bit too much to handle and so they're going to go ahead and bring in the new operator yeah i'm very interested to see how this plays out like you were saying i do think case western got a little bit tired of all the projectiles there or all the throwables rather that were coming out from Penn State and bringing out this one I will hopefully help them to again yeah supplement onto the Jaeger and prevent a little bit more of those throwables to come out and bother them but in this round we're gonna see if they're able to keep bakery held for a little bit longer than they were able to on the previous attempt at this site hold they ended up uh, relinquishing their control over this over Bakery at very early on into the round, which I think cost them at the end of the day. But Pufferfish Boy able to continue his kill streak and get that first pick onto the round, and just like that, Bakery control goes over to the way of Penn State. Yeah, and that's a really strong angle. Most people call it the car angle, as you can go ahead and climb up onto those back cars and see right over the Bakery counter, and that's exactly where the rest of the PSA attackers force that Wamai to go ahead and rotate. But speaking of rotate, Sango Mango Down has gone ahead and is going towards Harry Potter of Bottom Red, waiting for an attacker to maybe go ahead and force his way into Small Bakery and right into his gunfire, as Soma does already, as Asimio is going to go ahead and take out the Thermite once again, using his ACOG to its full advantage. Yeah, this 3v4 situation, it does look pretty good 
uh, for both sides, honestly. It could go either way, just going to rely on who's able to win these initial gunfights into this last interaction. Asimio able to get a second one for himself on the round, and just like that, we're in a 4v2 situation. Now it looks a lot more difficult for Pufferfish Boy and McNutt to make this round go in their favor. Although, if the defense does approach one at a time, we might see a similar situation to what we saw last time. Pufferfish Boy get into a little bit of an altercation with Asimio over there. Neither one able to do too much damage to the other, but with a minute left in the round, there's still time for this defense, or the attack rather, to take it slow and calculate the decisions a little bit more. With the diffuser actually going down, now the attack, the defense is on the back foot here. Yeah, definitely on the back foot, but they do have the man advantage for this retake situation as the first airdrops are going to hit, and two players are flanking into small bakery here as the Nomad will go down, and Pufferfish is left in another 1v4 situation. He has the LMG in hand, but a whole lot of people behind him as Pufferfish is going to unfortunately fall to M. Simneo in case Western's going to take their first round of the match. Yeah, I really want to highlight uh, M. Simneo's play in these last two rounds, actually. Unfortunately, in the previous round, weren't able to capitalize off of it and get that round victory, but they have been really putting the team on their back as far as fragging goes, winning almost every gunfight they choose to partake in. And that has been overall very, very helpful for this defense that can't seem to maintain control over those necessary portions of the map for quite as long as they need to. Yeah, but you can relinquish the control if you have a player like a Simneo just sitting there with their ACOG, taking these long gauge long range engagements just really popping the head off the attackers as they flow in through those breach holes and other choke points however we will be going back up top once again as case western is going to try their hand at the third floor bomb site once again they were unable to come out successful on the first two rounds but they are opting to bring the cap can this time most likely going to be tracking these entry denial traps and trying to get some free damage onto these on the onslaught rush of these Penn State confident attackers. Yeah, exactly. That cap can we can see it as a direct response to the fast paced aggressive pushing of Penn State that we've been seeing throughout this map. And going back to this third floor site, it's important that Case Western has really re reimagined their defensive strategy and hopefully are able to hold this piano room for a little bit longer than they have been in the past. And maybe just win a couple more of those gunfights, maybe take some longer range ones, as it seems those are the gunfights that they've been winning for the most part throughout this map. Yeah, they're definitely trying to play to the power of the operators that they're picking with the Doc and the Rook getting a majority of their frags, as well as Tim Consuelo getting on a nice late flank with the Jaeger, trying to take those gunfights with the superior 416C carbine that he wields. They are also bringing in Tango Mango down on the Legion, putting out some of those goo mines, trying again with the trap meta to slow down these attackers as they've just been bullying their way straight into very powerful positions and getting a lot of map control for free as quickly as possible. Yeah, having those two trap operators, I really, really like that choice because, it, yeah, as we were saying, it does seem that is one of the weaknesses of this Case Western defense, not being able to resist that initial push and usually end up losing uh, a few members to it. And if we're able to see these trap operators come out and do exactly what they're supposed to do, I imagine we're going to see a much more even uh, player count going into the later minutes of the round. Yeah, and here we're getting an aggressive play from McNutt on the IQ, trying to take out the Doc. However, Asimio is just winning every gunfight. He goes forward and takes the IQ off of the Repel, and he will be making sure that white hall control is still in the favor of the defenders as we are seeing tango mango down still holding over to that pixel bench corner and tim Venezuela is playing underneath going to try to get a flank in conjunction with noxious leon playing below possibly with a nitro cell trying to wait for these attackers to get inside piano to nuke the floor out from underneath them yeah and this is a perfect some perfect play from the roamers coming out as we can see the attackers are now very much aware that the roamers are down on this second floor. And what that is going to force them to have to do is is take time away from their attack and their push in general to go and deal with them, which, as we can see, is paying off for them. With only a minute left in the round, this attack is much further behind than we had seen in the previous two defensive tries on this site. 
Yeah, and as a roamer, you definitely are just going to try to kill as much time as possible because time is probably your biggest weapon on defense. But speaking of weapons, Tango Mango Down is going to use his to put a full effect and take out the Thatcher. But however, the breaches have been open, so his utility was almost done, but it's always nice to have a good gun like the L85 on your side. As we're seeing Simneo also take out Jumpy Guy, and that's the Thermite off the board as well. Now in a 5v2 instance, Case Western is looking a lot stronger on this, but Pufferfish will get the refrag after Tim Venezuela does get a pick here. But Pufferfish is now in another clutch instance. I don't know how many times he's going to have to do this for his team. However, this Capcan is right behind him in a powerful position, just tanking these track stingers getting those Legos straight into his feet, but he is in the position right here, but unfortunately barely misses out as the LMG is going to take down the ACOG of Levent. He's going to run straight into Capcan, but it's not enough as he's going absolutely nuclear, getting a triple kill for himself as now 11 seconds are on the board. There's not a whole lot of time. He's going to have to get the diffuser unless he goes ahead and just tries to get frags out. But with five seconds left, he's putting the diffuser down and the wallbang is going to go out from a Simeo, but he's going to play a bit more passive for a retake situation. However, Pufferfish will just opt to save his KD, get off the diffuser, make his stats look just that little bit better. Yeah, I thought we were going to see it again coming out from Pufferfish Boy in that incredible clutch potential, really putting that LMG to good use yet again. This gridlock has been paying huge dividends for the attack of Penn State, and even in the rounds that they're not able to win, you can see just how effective it's that operator is able to be. Uh, when used correctly and when your teammate is able to back you up appropriately. Yeah, and the, definitely the backup is needed, but it's like whenever Pufferfish does anything, Asimnio is just right back as both of these tyrants of their team are just trading blow for blow. Each of them have eight kills, and it's just up to the rest of the supporting cast to try to keep up and supplement two. As soon as Asimnio gets a really good round, it's like Pufferfish answers right back. And it's really up to those other eight operators to see, to try to break the stalemate that we're seeing between this Rook and Gridlock. Yeah, and now it took a long time for us to get here, but we are gonna end up heading to that reading room mining uh, bomb site here on the second floor, which as we were saying, or the reading room, dining room, sorry, bomb site on the second floor, as we were saying is one of those tertiary sites that teams go to because they have to and typically aren't looking. If they lose this site, they're not, too worried about it is you know one of those sites that kind of is a throwaway for a lot of teams but for case western this is a site they absolutely need to win to maintain a good standing going into their attacking half if they end up ending this defensive half uh in a 4-2 deficit it'd be very detrimental for them going on to their attacking half and would put them on a substantial back foot mentally and you know as far as the game goes yeah, it's definitely not an ideal situation they would want to be in. When you get 3-3, it's not the end of the world. However, as if you fall down 2-4 on your attacks, it's definitely an uncomfortable situation that you're going to have to claw your way back. But I think the most interesting thing about this reading room bomb site is most likely how a lot of teams do play. They are most likely going for a lot of vertical control, as most teams will up just defend it in a very similar fashion to the third floor bomb site. As you really want to hold third floor as long as possible and stop these soft breachers such as K-Bear here on the sledge, from opening up holes and exposing your anchors in their power positions down below. Yeah, if you are if you find yourself in the position where you have to give up this third floor control, you have to rely on a lot of lucky or just precisely chosen guns gunfights for the rest of the round to secure that victory. We are going to see only Noxious Leon up here on the second floor totally, but Tim, the, Tim Contuela is on these white stairs, going to engage a little bit onto this attack, not do any damage and not take any damage for himself, but is able to slow down a little bit. Yep, and we're going to see some pings coming out from the default cams here as the attackers are starting to push towards Pufferfish Boy, and Tim Venezuela will get the opening pick onto McNutt, and that's the Sophia off the board. That's a potential another soft breacher here, but the soft breacher of the... Sledge has already pushed up all the way through Cocktail. Unfortunately, Noxious Leon to fall back. He's going to take some shots out from the Thatcher, but will escape with his life down to below hatch. Possibly going to go for a cheeky little nitro toss of anybody stacked up inside Cocktail. Yeah, it is a little tough angle to get that nitro cell up there, but very doable. Unfortunately, Sledge is going to make his way over away from that potential C4 location and just bust up this floor a little bit. Maybe make the defenders feel a little bit more uncomfortable than they were. Pufferfish Boy actually able to get 
the first kill for the attack onto this round. And now back into a 4v4 situation with a minute left in the round. The, the Bromers definitely did their job. We saw a lot of time being wasted and a lot of damage being done to this attack. So for Case Western, you're pretty proud of your Roamers in this situation. Yeah, there's still 45 seconds left on the board with four apiece on each side. So there's going to be some more DIY remodeling of the floor here. Coming up from the rest of the attackers as they're going to look to push forward on their execute. Over Noxious Leon has just bypassed the gridlock tracks with a little bit of precise punch work, a little bit of gunplay. But Tango Mango Down will be taking down K-Bear and putting the number advantage back to Case Western. As Noxious Leon also gets a cheeky little flank kill onto Pufferfish Boy. And that's the clutch minister off the board for... PSA. So now Kyo, it's all up to Kyo and Jumpy Boy as Tango Mango Down does go down to the gun of the Thatcher as Jumpy Guy goes ahead and breaches and rushes straight into sight to try to get this plant down. Tim the Consuela will get the kill onto Kyo and leave it into a necessary plant situation as Tim the Consuela does go ahead and clean up the round and tie up the half at 3 3 for Case Western. Yeah, that was a, a great defensive round, especially like I was saying during the round from the Roamers. They were able to perform their jobs very, very effectively and even go above and beyond the Call of Duty there, really, with Noxious Leon taking that late round roam to, which ended up getting them the kill on to Pufferfish Boy, that, uh, that operator that had continually proved to be a nuisance on this defense. But now with this side switch, hopefully we're able to see Case Western uh, pick and choose some nice gunfights and maybe play quite aggressively like Penn State was doing to them. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing about the team composition for Case of Western here is they are going to be opting to use the Nomad in lieu of the gridlock that we saw last time from Penn State. Nomad is another flank watch operator. However, her air jabs are a little bit more aggressive in the manner that they just go ahead and blow up and throw the attacker straight into a fit of being sort of in an unsafe situation. They're completely rendered helpless for a couple seconds as they get knocked straight on their butts from those air jabs. They also make a whole lot of noise as to alert the attackers of the exact location of that flanker. And unlike those track stingers, they're not as easily destroyed as we saw. Um, uh, it was Noxious Leon went ahead and just like knifed them out and was able to sneak his way back up. That is most likely an adjustment that these case Western attackers don't want a similar fashion of a little bit of a flank going their way. Yeah, I think, um, like you were saying, there is a, a little bit of a difference, some slight uh, nuance behavior, but actually in the middle of that K-Bear, able to take out the, the first pick on for the defense here. Not Does not bode well with 10 seconds into the round. Noxious Leon being taken down. Again, the hero uh, that we saw from the previous round. But uh, going into this defense on third floor, we are going to want to see um, a lot of control being taken and just held for as long as possible here onto piano. Yeah, and that was definitely a little bit of a cheeky spawn peek out from K-Bear and taking the Noxious Leon off the board, who was definitely a good fragger here and on a strong fragging off of Zofia. That's going to be a little bit of utility gone. That's going to make it a little bit more difficult to get rid of the Maestro cams the Jumpy guys bring, as well as clear the ADSs of McNutt, as we are seeing a very powerful show of the Sledgehammer coming out from Levent, getting rid of those hatches and allowing some access into the third floor for the attackers. Yeah, the attack here has done some pretty interesting stuff, able to open up this entire piano, all the windows in piano, and McNutt able to actually capitalize on those broken windows, I believe, and pick one up for himself. Uh, making this now a 5v3 situation with a minute and 30 seconds left in the round. It's looking really good for the defenders here. They have a lot of intel on their side, a lot of late round stopping power with the lesion, which, as uh, you may know, gets stronger the longer they are alive, able to get more and more of those goo mines out onto this field. And as you get later into the round, the last thing you want to deal with is running into a site and getting hit with a goo mine. Yeah, as you will have to pull that needle out of your leg before you try to plant as well as that audio cue will alert the defenders of your location as well as stopping your sprinting ability. However, I think the biggest thing here was that the Nomad did go down quite early. There's not going to be those air jab placements stopping the late flank of these Penn State roamers that might be lingering down below 
here. This cave bear actually is playing a really aggressive angle right beneath the skylight, probably in a location that these attackers might not exactly expect and does have a nice cheeky little angle to an upside down repel that this iq might be trying to take advantage of but speaking of taking advantage of levent will take advantage of the over aggression of mcnutt and take him off the board and that's one roamer gone as they're trying to claw their way back into a more neutral location there's still a man down however time is ticking away the diffuser's still in hand and they have access to sight via the doors and tango mango has actually swung in but he will be taken down here as Pufferfish does clean up his kill as well as the rest of the team getting cleaned up by K-Bear and Jumpy Guy respectively and putting up to a 4-3 score line for Penn State. And yeah, that was a much, uh, a pretty expected result uh, on that third floor defense. Usually one of those sites like we were saying that the defense will typically be able to win as it's a quite a difficult site to attack. And with those first two picks going the way of the defense, it forces your attack to kind of rethink the strategy and maybe adjust what your plan is going in. And with, and with only very limited time left in the round, adjusting your whole attack strategy is not something that many teams are willing to do or even capable of doing. So, Yeah, it's definitely one of those things that your IGL is going to have to try to sort of corral the troops and put everything back into place as some of those key pieces were taken off the board in the forms of that Zofia and Nomad the flank watch was not being able to be properly fully executed as well as that extra utility that the Zofia brings trying to clear ADSs was most likely very difficult but we are going to get to see um, Kitchen being played for the first time as Penn State is electing to go this for their second round we're seeing a pretty similar setup with the Valkyrie for Intel as well as the Maestro Jaeger Bandit combination. But this is going to be the first time we're seeing smoke out here tonight. Smoke's a really great operator that as soon as that 30 second mark hits, she can throw out all of those um, toxic babe canisters and cut off any ability to plant if you're stuck whiffing in that gas. Yeah. Coming into a, a late round push against a smoke with all three toxic babes is definitely not something you want to have to deal with as an attacker and is almost an insurmountable uh, block to your late round attack. So we're going to have to see the attack get uh, either force the smoke to waste those toxic babes or end up killing the smoke before they're able to utilize them very effectively. Yeah, but... I think the best thing about Smoke is definitely his kit with that SMG-11 shotgun combination. He's definitely a close range force to be reckoned with. You don't want to be in a narrow corridor such as um, kitchen prep area against a Smoke. But the Jaeger's going to go off the board really quickly as Noxious Leon does get the opening pick inside a piano. And that's the roamer for Penn State down as Noxious Leon is just taking a lot of map control as the rest of his team is following suit and doing a more top-down processing way of eliminating and making sure that the entire map is clear yeah there's some really good drone work going on on the side of case western here using those drones to gather some very effective and useful intel very early on in the round and i imagine that had a lot to do with the ability of noxious leon to get that initial pick onto mcnutt and have, losing the jaeger so early is it's good and bad you never want to lose an operator quite so early, but Jaeger being an operator that is able to put down all of the utility at the beginning of the round, you're not really missing much except for a very, very good gun. Yeah, definitely one of the strongest guns on defense, as it usually does accompany one of your biggest fraggers as McNutt is going to go down. The Noxious Leon is going to be using his lifeline to reconstruct the floor in conjunction with most likely Levent's breaching hammer to really make the site of Kitchen very dangerous to sit on as all these angles are being pushed forward here by the breaching round. As now he's going to be peeking over towards the wall and most likely trying to take off the bandit batteries so the Thatcher's utility can be saved. He's actually getting a quite cheeky angle on top of the mining machine. However, the bandit is sitting close in prep room in a safe location as the rest of the drone work for Asenio is finding out the exact locations of the rest of the defenders. Yeah, and with 45 seconds left in the round, the attack is looking like they're in a very good position. Up one man, actually up two men, Jumpy Guy being downed and then K-Bear being taken out. Now Jumpy Bear, very low HP, was able to get picked back up, but 
at an amount of HP where one bullet from any gun in the game pretty much will end up taking his life. Now we're going to see some of these toxic babes come out right at the very end of the round. Like we said, we might see two being used right off the bat. So now we'll only have one left going into the end of the round. But Puffer Fish Boy able to take out, uh, get his first kill on the round with that SMG 11. Very nice gun. And a Semineo actually able to take out. Oh, and then just like that, Tim the Consuela takes out two. Jumpy Guy gets one for himself, but unfortunately it's a futile effort. And the attack is able to pull out that round win. Yeah, that was an absolute flurry of trades that we unfortunately were not able to catch as the diffuser was going down. However, you just got, need to know that the attackers came out on top on the back of Tendo Consuela, going in and turning that Thatcher, who's usually more of a supporting op, straight into the entry frag with that beautiful AR-33 weapon. Yeah, that round was... It really came down to the initial pick on that roamer, because as we saw, that was the only operator that uh, PS... PSU had allocated outside of the site. So once that Jaeger went down so early on in the round, it really gave up pretty much map it gave up map control to pretty much everywhere on the map that wasn't the site. Which when defending kitchen is really, really not something that you can afford to do, especially so early on in the round. With all those soft floors being able to be destroyed, like we saw noxiously on that Zofia doing some of that remodeling like you were saying and putting some extra pressure onto the defense. Yeah, and we're going to see a actually fully identical team composition for both of these teams as PSA is going to try it to run it back one more time. They're going to be doing a very similar, most likely complete setup of this site and just going to try to capitalize on their mistakes and really fix those and fine tune the way that they played as opposed to their team composition. There's going to be a beautiful Valk cam coming out from Soma, giving the intel as he did notice that a lot of the case western attackers did funnel down that brown stairs main lobby area tried to lob some grenades over that broken wall and take out the anchors that were playing in their safe location near freezer and plates i believe we are going to be able to we're going to see jaeger go back onto this roam and give it a second shot i do imagine we'll see a little bit more conservative play uh maybe stay a little bit closer to site not take any unnecessary risks here as being the initial pick in that last round was what ended up causing uh, all the dominoes to fall over and the defense to ultimately fall apart but if he is able to stay alive for a considerable amount of time longer than he was last round or maybe even get some picks it's going to be a lot closer and a more difficult round for the attackers to have to deal with yeah, but Asimio was just taking some drone work and getting really aggressive all the way and taking all of third floor control with this drone work. He's most likely going to be using those air jabs to cut any rotations as it is evident that the roamers are not here on third floor with all of that drone work going on. Levin is just going to be peeking around here, but McNutt is going on a little bit of a flank towards Red Stairs, trying to come up behind these unsuspecting attackers. But now the drone will spot him out. His location is known. He's going to get an initial gunfight with Levin and go ahead and run away with his life over more drones are seeing him try to fall back as now he's in a little bit of a frenzy and possibly going to be getting pinched by Simneo on the Nomad. Yeah, unfortunately we saw those railings uh, play a, a pretty big role in that gunfight actually. Unable to get any shots off because uh, the railings were in the way. But Jaeger able to escape with his life, gather some good information, waste a lot of time and now being in a 5v5 with a minute and a half left in the round is is a pretty good place to be. You want you have all of your operators left available. You have some pretty valuable intel on where the attack is coming from, and you should be able to make something of this information. Yeah, you're actually able to take out one more drone for himself, and now with this with this new spectator UI, we're actually able to see just how many drones are left for the attack. And as we can see, there's only four left here, which is a lot less information than I'm sure the attack wants to have to deal with. McNutt. Almost takes a little bit of a gunfight over there on Red Stairs. Not actually able to make anything of it for either side. But now with 50 seconds left in the round, it's going to be, I would imagine, an all-out push coming in kind of late here. Yeah, McNutt's roam is completely transformed from a super hyper-aggressive to a definitely more traditional as he's sort of peeking in and out and causing a whole lot of mayhem for these attackers. He's still lingering in the back of their mind as his location is not known. As actually the Nomad is right next to him. It does seem as if neither operator knows, but McNutt's going to have the reaction time and take off the head of Simneo. Go ahead and peek out and see Levent here. 
But Tango Mingo down will be falling down to K Bear, but Levent does get a refrag onto McNutt, leaving a 4v3 situation. 15 seconds left on the board, and it's getting a little bit spicy here as the first smoke charges are going down. And he's playing close on this shield. Kosoma is going to get a pick, but Consuela is going to go back as K Bear does get the refrag down in a 1v3 situation. Noxus Leon's going to have to climb a mountain, but it's not going to be enough as the bandit swings out and finishes the round for PSA. Yeah. Like I was saying, we did see a pretty chaotic final push there that was, it was stopped primarily in part due to the great roam work of McNutt on that Jaeger, able to move around and kind of distract the attackers from their initial objective of, of clearing out those, both the third and second floor as quickly as possible and moving their way down onto that first floor. Did a lot of scurrying around um, and kind of just, leading the attack on a wild goose chase there which ended up costing them a lot of time and unfortunately some pretty crucial gunfights yeah and you may look at his stat line on the jaeger only being at five and eight it's definitely not the best kd that you want to have however i do believe he is definitely filling his role as best as he can as he's trying to just as a roamer you're trying to kill as much time as possible you don't necessarily need to kill as many attackers as time is always on your side if you're a defender, every second you kill is the second the attackers don't have to execute. They're going to start feeling a little bit more rushed, a little bit more crazed, and really have to get things going as they push forward on their final execute. Yeah, it was great to see the adaptation um, come out in the way that McNutt was roaming. Because we did see him get taken out as the initial pick two rounds ago now. And then in that previous round, was able to adapt and change up his whole roam strategy to one that proved to ultimately to be much more effective. So I imagine we will be seeing a similar roam style coming out onto this uh, third floor defense. Maybe move around onto the second floor, try to lead the attackers in a, an area that they don't necessarily want to be. Yeah, but I think if we're talking about this, there is a excess of nitro cells on the board for Penn State. They're possibly whipping out a little bit of a pocket strategy as K-Bear has opted to take the pulse and will be feeding information with the cardiac sensor as he can see heartbeats through the wall and knows the exact location of these attackers without any sort of opposing intel for that. He can go ahead and make some pings if he's in conjunction with Soma or Pufferfish down below and could be using those nitro cells to great effect down below, maybe get some free kills. Yeah, I imagine there's going to be a lot heavier of a roam presence here with the Mozzie, Jaeger, and Pulse all being able to get around the map pretty quickly. The Pulse being positioned, uh, I believe on the, I think he's in bathroom, or uh, yep, in bakery now. This is a pretty common place to see a Pulse play on cafe, able to get any intel on the second floor, which is something that the attackers are going to want to clear out before making their initial push onto this third floor site. However, if they have not done a diligent drone work, they might not know if Pulse is even on the board and their locations on these windows is definitely not safe as this cardiac sensor can see through the walls and see anybody just sitting on a rappel such as we're seeing this is Sophia over towards White Stairs. Now we're gonna see some pings go out as his location is known and the Pulse will be rotating over trying to feed any information that he can. As now Kiyosoma does get the initial pick onto that upside down repelled Zofia. And now not a great situation for Case Western going forward here. We actually did see a run out from Somas. He went ahead and flew straight out that window, did a little bit of a risky play, but was rewarded for it in terms of a kill. And now the Romers having killed a substantial amount of time on this round are probably gonna start making their way closer onto this site to prepare for the final push that's gonna come out from Case Western. Tango Mango down trying his best to locate any utility that might stop this push from going as effectively as they want it to. I don't believe he's able to get any substantial information using that scanner of IQs, but we'll see if this nice little angle on top of this air conditioning unit is able to pay off. We're going to see a little peak come in here from Kiyosoma, not able to capitalize on that IQ having just moved out of the way right before that peak came out. Now 38 seconds left on the board. Case Western's definitely going to have to get a little bit aggressive and start steamrolling their way into attack. Diffuser is still in hand, but there's roamers such as McNutt playing below, putting pressure 
towards the rest of these players. And as we talked about the Nitros, it does come true as Kaber gets another pick onto a Simeo and takes one of the top frags off the board here. Now we're seeing Pufferfish playing quite aggressive with the super shorty as Levent does go down. Then the Consuela is able to take out Pufferfish. However, that shotgun was not quite strong enough. But now some floor bangs coming out from the pulse below, trying to take out I actually will go ahead and take out the rest of these players as Penn State goes ahead and wins one more round on Cafe. Interesting that we saw a late round uh, cat can try to kill there. Don't see that too often. Very unfortunate when it happens to you. It's very, very frustrating. <laughs> so I imagine we're going to see a little bit more caution coming out from this attack. Uh, in regards to those trap operators that we've seen be pulled out a uh, time and time again here yeah and i think that's where capcan especially shines as an operator he's not necessarily one of those quote unquote meta picks that people like to talk about so much but there's nothing more frustrating when there's 30 seconds left you got to push it to site and you keep on hitting little explosives on the door that you don't have time to really check for and they definitely pack a punch as they take away 51 damage which is a little bit over half of your health so maybe you've taken a little bit of gunfight damage and it could just take you down yeah as i like to say these trap operators do thrive in the the last round the end of the round chaos here which is what we ended up seeing uh, in that previous round and now we're gonna actually see the defense move over to this reading dining bomb site which i don't believe we've been able to see them defend thus far. So hopefully they have some fun strats for us to showcase and maybe Case Western is able to read into those and make an effective push here. Maybe clear, hopefully clear out that third floor pretty quickly and get some of that vertical control set up so they don't have to wait until super late in the round to make their push. Yeah, we're seeing some put down some of those aforementioned entry denial devices Popping around exactly all up stairs as he's also going to be seeing K Bear go for another spawn peak cover. It will not be fruitful this time around. Vigil will be rotating back upstairs and joining the rest of the Rome crew up on third floor, trying to protect the floor that is very fragile and very destructible for the anchors that might be playing down below. So now, some more drones are going off the board. The intel of Case Western is slowly getting diminished. But speaking of diminished, the hatches are now gone thanks to that Italian shotgun that we see Amaru bring here. Amaru does have the diffuser, which could be quite interesting, but more interesting is Tango Mango down getting the initial pick onto McNutt, but he's instantly refragged out as Soma gets a pick with a nitro cell onto Leon. That was quite an impressive pick onto McNutt there. I believe coming through. Uh, a window over on towards that piano side. K Bear actually able to pick up one onto that new drop hatch. Uh, very unfortunate for Tim uh, there. Got caught off guard a little bit. We are going to see a Semineo going down here. Maybe able to get revived if they're able to win this gunfight. Yep. Levent able to take out Kiyosoma and pick back up a Semineo and put them back into an even situation going to the back half of this round. Yeah, now the smoke has settled and it's left at 3-3. But speaking of that, K-Bear will put it back into the advantage of the defenders as he takes down Tango Mango down. Now it's left to Levent and Asimio and they have about 70 health <laughs> combined. But Asimio will now go down to one of those cap can traps that we've been raving about, leaving the rest of this game onto the back of Levent. He needs to ice out this round to give his ch team the rest of any shot to taking this map. As if PSA does win this round, it will spell the end of CAFE and we'll go straight up into coastline with a lead for PSA here. Now there's going to be the diffuser being brought straight back into the hands of Levent as he's trying to get any sort of opening that he can. He needs to really try to isolate out these defenders into one-on-one -on -one gunfights. But if PSA has anything to say about it, they will be trying to set up some sort of refragging situation to use their man advantage to full effect. Yeah, and I don't, unfortunately for Levent, I don't believe uh, the attack is in position of very much until a lot of their drones have been destroyed and uh, with all these operators dead, many of the drones may not be in very advantageous places. k are able to actually kind of be approaching this fight through into train, actually able to get Levent caught off guard there looking through into dining room and just like that, Cafe is over and PSU goes up 
1-0 in the series. So it definitely was a great showing for Penn State, but this we do have to think about how this was their map choice. So it definitely was a map that they were more comfortable on, definitely comfortable enough to make it one of their picks in a very important playoff series. But as we look at the end of the stats, K-Bear and Pufferfish definitely popped off just a little bit as they both have 14 and 11 kills respectively. And now we will go ahead and take a five minute break to let these players sort of reset, talk about things, maybe go to the bathroom, maybe get some water as well as give us casters just a little bit to catch our breath. So we'll see you in about five minutes.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, as we're going to be getting straight into Coastline, as this is going to be map two of this series between Penn State Academy and Case Western Reserve University. And unfortunately, we do have to report that the fragger we saw last map in Asimnio has unfortunately had to be subbed out due to his internet issues, but we will be seeing Codell trying to fill those big shoes that he left behind, and especially on a fragging map like Coastline. There are going to be some pretty big shoes to fill, almost clown-sized. Yeah, this is actually... Uh, the first time that Codell has been subbed in for Case Western. So in his debut, we'll see if he's able to pull something out of a, a bag of tricks on the map that usually demands a bag of tricks. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a bag of tricks indeed, as you need the fragging power here. And it does seem as if Case Western does just really not like the Dogabi as they will be opting to ban her once again in a repeat fashion of a last match. They really don't want that roam denial tool as well as PSA going for another Jackal ban, mirroring both attacker bans that we saw last round. Yeah, I would not be surprised if we saw um, the exact same bans as we saw in Cafe here. Mira, usually a, a perma ban on this map. Um, at least in recent history. So I imagine we're going to see, yep, there we go. There's the mirror ban, and then either Echo or Maestro would be my bet here. Not one of those. You don't want to really deal with those Intel operators uh, too much on a map like this. Yeah, and Echo is a very strong operator, as well as Maestro. And we are going to go ahead and see this last ban coming out for Case Western, as it will be the Echo once again, as both of these... Um, bands are going to fully mirror last round. And if last game was any sort of predecessor of this map, it's definitely going to be exciting and action-packed as we go into the second round of this series tonight. Yeah, I'm really excited to see what these two teams have prepared for us on Coastline. It's not a map that I've uh, had the opportunity to cast very much so far this season, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to see uh what we're gonna what we're gonna be looking at from these two teams and be able to commentate on some of that action yeah i think the coolest thing you can talk about coastline is just the way it's structured it's almost like imagine it's a giant square it's two squares tacked on top of each other but just remove the entire middle and make it hollow and that allows the roof to be used to full effect as you can really cut a whole lot of rotations from the roof areas there are some sort of little slits in the hallways that let you get really long lines of sight so definitely as a defender roaming possibly or rotating in between sites, you have to be very cautious of what lines of sight you are exposing yourself towards. Yeah, that's a really good point. Being able to cut off those rotations is, is imperative, especially if the defense is going to be running a roam heavy uh, defense like I imagine we'll be seeing from both of these teams. Uh, as you're going to want to take a lot of gunfights on this map or maybe not want to take them, but you're going to take them regardless so having some pretty having a lot of roamers with some really good guns is going to pay uh immense dividends here for this defense it looks like we're going to see uh an off-site hold from vigil and ella over inside of uh theater here interesting to see i'll wonder if this is going to pay off for him yeah it looks like this is a pretty good call out here from the these two defenders with Four out of the five attackers spawning over here by Lamborghini door. Yeah, and it's because of how Coastline is structured, there's only two floors that you can actually sort of as a defender be accessible. You aren't going to be able to do one, those vertical holes that we saw in Cafe. You're going to have to go for more of a horizontal hold as you're seeing these roamers get stretched out on the same floor, still being with an earshot of sight, but you're going to have people like Tim Lagonzuela and Noxious Leon with really strong guns on Ella and Vigil trying to take the engagements on their terms as a, as opposed to the rest of these attackers. Yeah, and Coastline living up to its name already. Not any deaths so far, but a lot of action uh, coming in within this first minute. Uh, Noxious Leon, I don't know if he noticed it, but actually did end up getting droned out. So his position, position is being revealed to the attackers. And I imagine we're going to see some sort of sandwich to try to clear out uh, this Ella from inside of 90 hallway. Yep, and Caper will go ahead and drop and be behind this vigil and try to use that R4C to full effect, but it will not 
finish it off. As now the Vigil does know, but he doesn't know as K Bear does get the opening pick onto Thing as well. And we'll be using that breaching round to open up a long line of sight towards 90 as Jumpy Guy does go ahead and get the pinch onto Noxious Leon and remove both of the roamers in one fell swoop. And Ash in that confrontation getting taken down to just about 5 HP here. Jumpy Guy able to get another one for himself on the Lion. Uh, that's a gun that a lot of people are very, very comfortable with. It has some pretty easy to control recoil and a, a very big magazine. So if you can get yourself into an advantageous position, you can do a lot of damage with that gun. Yeah, I definitely like to think of that gun as almost, it's just a little bit faster firing rate version of the L85. And that's one of those base of the mill guns that everybody can be comfortable with. So it's definitely one that I feel comfortable in my hands as a Thatcher main. Here, you can just sort of be rotated onto the vector of Lion as well. But the rest of these attackers have We've gone ahead and pushed up and taken Aqua Balcony control as well as all the way in Aqua. Caper is getting aggressive and trying to go for these wall bangs, but he does not have the critical information to get the pinpoint the exact locations and will fall straight into the line of sight of Livent and get a refrag out in this situation. The first line scan is going to go out, forcing these defenders to freeze in sight as Kiyosoma does get a pick onto Kodo and leave Levent in a clutch situation. The fuser has gone down in a 4v1 situation. Levent's definitely going to have to hit some magic here as the first shots are going to go out onto the Thatcher, but it's not enough as he's going to be put into the down but not out state that Soma will be able to take advantage of and ice out this first round for the attackers. Yeah, that was a, a very interesting attack that came out. We, The Lion was able to save all of his E1D charges until the very end when they were needed the most on that final push. And once they took control of Aqua, it was really just up to the dock uh it was a one-man army against four people coming in through billiards able to get the one kill onto the ash um initially but at the end of the day it just wasn't enough and if i do say so that there's nothing more frustrating than playing as doc and getting downed and trying to get yourself back up but the person is still just looking at you the whole time yeah, it's definitely one of those situations that, sure, Doc may be able to pick himself back up, but it's really only helpful, like, let's say if you're spawn peeking and they hit you in the chest a few times, you fall beneath the window, pick yourself back up, and run with your tail between your legs back to safety. But now, as Case Western is going on a defense once again, they are opting to go downstairs to the kitchen site, which is definitely a little bit more interesting here as you are going to be able to do a little bit more of a vertical hold because it is on the first floor. You're most likely going to want to have some roamers upstairs trying to stop the attackers from completely remodeling the roof above the rest of your anchors. There's definitely some long lines of sight and really powerful positions you can cut off from above if you're using the necessary soft breach. But in this instance, it does seem as if the composition for Penn State does not quite have a whole lot of soft breach. They're going to have to rely heavily on McNutt and Pufferfish Boy to try to get that soft breach that they need. Uh, I do want to point out that we are seeing a, an alibi from Tango Mango down for the first time in this series. I'm very excited to see what they're able to do with that operator. Uh, one of my favorites, I think, that MX4 Storm is one of the one of the most fun game uh, guns to play with in this game. So, you know, if I were him, I'd be having a blast no matter what was going on. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely blast through some walls with those impact grenades that she does carry in her kit. As well as we can say that the MX4 Storm definitely does go brrrr very fast and can definitely do a whole lot of damage with a flurry of bullets. We are, the Vigil is going to be playing in a very similar position to uh, where he was playing in the last round. I'm not sure if the attack is aware of it. I do believe he got droned out, but decided not to move, uh, believing that he is going to be able to take out uh, those gunfights initially. Jaeger actually gets taken down on uh, over by that balcony here. Probably able to get out of the way and uh, be picked up by a teammate here, but not quite yet. Yeah, he's still in a quite dangerous position as he is sort of isolated over in that VIP area. Tim is going to go ahead and toss out an impact nade to try to get some information, maybe scare off an attacker just a little bit, try to peek a little bit of damage. As he's looking over towards Hall of Fame as K-Bear does drone out and find his exact location, gets a pre-fire out and a beautiful shot on Tim Venezuela as Pufferfish does finally claim his kill onto the Jaeger of Noxious Leon. That was a great pre-fire that um, we saw there from K-Bear. Got some very good intel, knew exactly where to shoot onto that vigil inside of theater, and just real quick able to take out that and give themselves another little bit of an advantage here. Uh, with a minute left in the round, uh, K-Bear actually able to take out a second one for himself, and 
in a 2v5 situation uh, with uh, one roamer and a maestro, it it's possible, but you're gonna need some pretty calculated gunfights and some isolated ones at that. Yeah, and isolated out, both of these defenders will be as PSA takes a full flawless round as each of their players did just do their role absolutely masterfully. Actually, a crazy shot from McNutt, quite nutty if I do say so myself, as he turns on the alibi fully and hits a clip. Yeah, we are going to see the sad face coming out from Tango Mango down. A pretty appropriate reaction to that one. They had a pretty good defensive setup, but unfortunately was able to be picked apart pretty systematically by the attack uh, from Penn State. It all started over in that... Uh, in the theater and VIP rooms when uh, Jaeger was able to go down so early from balcony thanks to that LMG that Puffer Fishboy has been putting to such good use throughout this entire series. And then Vigil getting taken down in theater kind of set the tone for the whole round. Really put the defense on, a, on the back foot quite early and they just weren't able to recover from it unfortunately. Yeah, I think the biggest part about this Penn State attack is how structured they are. They're setting up their refrags perfectly, and they're just pinching these roamers out as quickly as possible. But the best part about their roam clear is they aren't even having to use these EE1D scans of the lion here to try to freeze those roamers in place. It's just, it's a utility that they have in their back pocket and they might be able to use, but they haven't had to thus far, and Penn State is definitely punishing Case Western for not having to use that utility. But speaking of utility, there's definitely gonna be a bit of a utility dump as Case Western has opted to switch Tim the Consuelo onto Goyo. Goyo, as you know, is one of these operators that does bring in three explosive Vulcan shields that are gonna definitely, if you leave them up, can burn you just a bit as they explode, leave fire all over the place and can lock down entrance to site in a similar fashion to smoke canisters. Yeah, I really do think the Goyo pick is is going to be an advantageous one for Case Western. Able to put, maybe not a stop, but a little bit of a pause to the uh, Penn State attack with the you know the variability of having to deal with those deployable shields. It's not like you can just take them out as an attacker uh, without a significant amount of effort. Yeah, and that effort is going to have to come from McNutt. And if you do some math, he only has two explosive grenades in his lifeline launcher, and there are three shields on the board. However, if Tango Mango Down does do some good placement on his ADSs from Jaeger, it might be able to suck up a little bit of utility and leave those shields in a safe position for the rest of the round. And we are going to see Tango Mango over on uh, a nice cheeky little angle trying to get an upside down repel pick maybe. Unfortunately, no one is going to be there. And as I say that, somebody does pop up their head a little bit. Takes a, an initial gunfight, not able to get anything from that. And now forced to rotate away as he doesn't want to give up his location for too long. Yeah, and for this instance, Tango Mango Down is definitely going to be trying to stay alive as possible, trying to take advantage of any late flank here that he might be able to go forward, but K-Bear will be taking out Noxious Leon, and the first roamer goes down as Mute is gone. Tango Mango Down has gone all the way back to site and understands that the rest of the attack is coming over towards the hookah balcony side this time. Yeah, Tango Mango Down is making his way all over the map so far this round, and it's proven to be pretty effective for him. He hasn't been able to capitalize and get any kills with it, but I do believe he's wasted a lot of time, especially um, of uh, the gridlock that has been trying to deal with him this whole round. Unfortunately, going up those main stairs does get uh, stopped by those tracks, has to shoot out some of them, and ends up deciding to just rotate a around and rethink his whole setup here. Yeah, he's definitely dancing around these attackers just a little bit, doing a little tango as he mangoes his way down all around the map. Now some breaching is coming out as K-Bear is opening up some long lines of sight with the ex Kairos pellets of Hibana. And now the first line scan will go down, freezing these roamers in their spot as McNutt puts himself in an advantageous position to finally take down Tango Mango and put this to a 3v5 situation with 45 seconds left on the board. Yeah. Those being able to save those EE1D charges on the line until such so late in the round, as a defender, you might even forget that that's an uh, an option for the attackers here. And when that comes out, it could catch you off guard. Pufferfish boy able to take out uh, one for himself with that LMG in the gridlock, but Tim the Consuela able to get one right back. Now we're probably going to see the bomb go down in default over here from uh, Lion, but not able to take down another one for himself. And Tim Consuela gets one more right before he gets taken out. 
gets two, uh, but in the end it was a futile effort. And uh, PSU takes the round again. Yeah, they're definitely steamrolling just a little bit on coastline. However, we do have to say that this map can actually be one of the rare ones where it might swing a little bit more towards the attacking favor. However, Penn State is taking a commanding and resounding lead at 3-0. As it does seem, three of the defenders for Case Western have been unable to get a kill thus far. The rest of these teams, or the rest of the Penn State team, is sort of spreading the frags a little bit more evenly, but K-Bear and McNutt definitely stepping up just that little bit extra. Yeah, it does seem like uh, a lot of the members on Case Western are, are pretty ice cold right now, which is not a position you want to be in, um, especially on such a frag-heavy map. Hopefully they're able to pick up some momentum and warm themselves up a little bit so we can see a little bit more action here on, on their side, take some gunfights that benefit them a little bit more. They've So far they've been getting caught off guard and put into gunfights that they don't necessarily want to be in, it seems like. Um, and that has really cost them all three of these rounds uh, at the end of the day with the attack being able to just force those gunfights that they want uh, to be engaged in and really dictating the pace of this whole map thus far. Yeah, they're definitely, their room clear is just absolute poetry in motion at this point as they're just getting these picks that they needed with their necessary drone work in a very fast and unforgiving manner. They're really punishing these attackers for being a little bit too, or roamers, pardon me, for being a little bit too isolated in their positions. I would maybe like to see Case Western either go for a more turtle heavy strat, where they're going to anchor just that little bit heavy, or maybe switch their roam to more of a dual, traditional dual roam where these defenders are playing a little bit closer together, trying to get refrags and trying not to die in an unfraggable position. Yeah, always having your roaming buddy is very, very important, especially on this map when if you end up dying and nobody's there to refrag you, it could spell certain death for your defense. And I think we are going to see a little bit more of that buddy system roam coming out here. Tango Mango down and Tim the Consuelo playing a little bit closer to each other, but not quite as close as we would like to see them. And unfortunately, I think we're going to see a, a pretty quick gunfight coming in here uh, early, or, or not yet. McNutt's actually going to rotate away and make his way to the other side of the roof, thinking better of that uh, upside down rappel there. Yeah, and they are going to be pushing in most likely to try to force this alibi out of her location. But all of her prismas are placed near her, and it might seem like a little bit of a maze mind game, as you don't know which exact prisma might be the real one, as now Consuela will be dropping out some drones that are trying to force his position out. However, he as a vigil can just go ahead and cloak up and be invisible here. But K-Bear is just holding a really nice patient angle, waiting for this vigil to make a mistake and try to rotate and get this punish. Unfortunately, falling off that angle a little bit too early, Tim the Consuela actually able to pick up that kill in what seemed like a very uh, disadvantaged position. Getting that opening pick is uh, something that we haven't seen from the defense so far this map, and that could spell a different end to this round than we have seen in the past three. Yep, yeah, there's a minute 30 left. It's definitely nice to see the roamer still alive and kicking in this instance. There's going to be some more drone work as the vigil is taking a gunfight onto Lion. However, Jumpy Guy is going to come out on top in this instance and even out the score. But it's not going to live that lead, will not live for long as Tango Mango Down is able to take out McNutt. But Jumpy Guy is also downed in this instance. It did seem as if he traded as Noxious Leon's going below and trying to use this soft floor to his advantage and take out the rest of these attackers lined up inside of VIP. But Kyosomo will finally get a refrag onto the alibi of Tango Mango Down. And put it back to a 3-3 location. However, Jumpy Guy does have just a little bit of a health disadvantage as the rest of the defenders are full on. There's going to be some lion scans popping off as Pufferfish Boys using that big LMG to try to floor bang the rest of these defenders. Yeah, with a, uh, at the time there was a whole minute left in the round, I think it would have been advantageous for the attack to slow down a little bit, but they're keeping this pace up pretty quickly and trying to break up on that VIP floor like you were saying. They're going to have to make their way down, uh, I would imagine, cool vibe stairs here pretty quickly and try to make their way onto site. Because as uh, as I continue talking, they're running out of time. Uh, and that second EE1D going down with the plant actually coming out from Pufferfish Boy gets taken out by Levent in the middle of that plant. And now the attack is in a very disadvantage, disadvantaged position with the diffuser down in a pretty much unretrievable place. They're going to have to play for frags at this point. Yep, yeah, but these frags will go on to the side of Case Western's Noxious Leon takes the first one onto Shoma as Jumpy Guy does have to go ahead and pull out 
this goo mine from his leg. He has recovered the diffuser and is planting, but he's in a unwinnable situation as the rest of these attackers just flock to his location and force him off the diffuser as he tries to save his life. Yeah, that was a, a very interesting round. And I think the what ended up pushing it in favor of uh, Case Western's defense was that initial pick uh, that came out from Vigil, uh, Tim the Consuelo's Vigil, when he was in quite a bad situation. The, the attack had full intel on where he was, but uh, the Habana just fell off a little bit too early from inside that bathroom. Hopefully we're going to see... Uh, very similar play come out from uh, this defense again. Maybe get some some very effective roaming again like we just saw. Yeah, I definitely want to say I want to see Penn State keep up the aggression that they've shown thus far. They really just need to keep this balls-to-the-wall mentality as when they are controlling the pacing of this map, it has been putting a good record for them as they did take the first three rounds and they did it in blistering fashion. They pushed in, they got their picks in a very confident manner. But as soon as there was a little bit of pushback with Case Western getting the opening pick, that's where their attack did seem to falter just a little bit. And I want to see them be able to keep their mentality in a strong place and keep consistent with how they are going to play the rest of these defensive attacking rounds. Pardon me. Yeah, for PSA there, um, having that initial pick go against them for the first time so far on this map might have been a little bit of a, a shock for them as they've all been pretty hot on these gunfights and as we said before, Case Western's been pretty ice cold. Some of them starting to wake up a little bit, specifically, I believe, Tango Mango down, getting some kills for himself, uh, and Tim the Consuela picking up some more for himself on the on those roamers. But we are going to see Consuela go back onto this Goyo. It didn't quite pay off the way that I think he wanted it to the last time we saw it played, but hopefully we're going to see some a little bit uh, more effective play around these Goyo shields and use them to stop some pushes for a little bit longer than we were able to see him do last time yeah and i think the problem here is not with the anchors it's been more so with the roamers they need to stay alive like they did last round and they've shown that if they are able to stay alive they can definitely do the damage that they want to here but this room clear of penn state has been just so strong and we've raved about it just a little bit here and it's most likely will be coming out once again as the drone work is coming in as Sophia is just going to swing in white window as she's done most of these rounds but Tango Mango Downs using the same angle he did last time, trying to wait for the Sophia to swing. Maybe try to get a free kill with that very fast firing MX4 Storm, but the drone work will go out as now K Bear will be pinching him down and taking out Tango Mango Down and putting the first roamer off the board. Yeah, that was a great display of uh, drones being used to gather very effective intel. Um, McNutt actually able to take out one for himself, but we did see McNutt on that drone able to help out Kiyosoma and end up getting that kill on to the alibi when I believe the alibi thought uh, that he was in a little bit of an advantageous situation but in reality he was on the back foot the entire time yeah being on the back foot is not somewhere you want to be but now with the Goyo shield popped the rest of these attackers are going to be able to funnel their way into aquarium here which is a very powerful position that can just line straight up into sight and now that all the intel is gone, except maybe the Valk camera might still be beneath those couches, but K-Bear will now be using those x Kairos pellets to open up a nice long of sight onto the rotate hole, trying to now get a plant down with around a minute left. Yeah, um, we're going to see yeah, them setting up for a default plant over in Billiards. Got to get some of those angles opened up so they can take some long fights here. Tim the Consuela actually able to get one onto K-Bear. Plant is going down from Jumpy Guy. Looks like he's going to be able to finish this plant. Just barely escapes with his life. Takes a little bit of damage. Um, makes it out McNutt and Codell able to pick up uh, each one for themselves. And now a 3v2 situation with the Diffuser. This retake is going to be pretty difficult for Levent and Codell to pull off. But if they take their time and take some deep breaths and move as a unit, I think they could pull something off. Levent takes out one into a 2v2. McNutt actually able to take out Codell. And now it's all on Levent's shoulders unable to pick up that last kill on the vent onto McNutt actually sorry through that Habana hole that was created earlier on in the round yeah I believe that was a 4k for McNutt as he just really went a little bit nutty on that round he pushed in with Zofia used that strong gun as well as the utility to push forward and get all the map control necessary for his team to keep on pushing forward as he is 
sort of bearing the brunt of this attack for Penn State as he is at a scoreline of eight and one right now, really asserting his dominance on these unsuspecting Case Western defenders. Yeah, and I think something um, we haven't touched much on this map so far is how effective um, Penn State is with their drones and their drone economy. They've been able to gather very, very valuable uh, information throughout the round at all points. And even if the information doesn't directly lead to a kill, if you're a defender and you see a drone spot you, you do start to panic a little bit. You try to figure out where you have to go. And it, it seems like the attack from Penn State has covered any of the retreating paths for any of the roamers that get spotted out by these drones. Yeah, and I think that's definitely working in conjunction with their roam clear. All this intel is allowing these entry fraggers of McNutt and K-Bear to just go in not blind. They have all the intel that they need, and they know exactly where they need to point their guns and take out these roamers. They're really trapping them in areas where they're controlling the engagements as opposed to the defenders really creating their lines of sights and knowing where the attackers are. Usually as an anchor or a roamer, you want to funnel the attackers into somewhere where you're picking the terms of engagement. But Penn State is definitely doing a great job with their roam clear and their drone work of really they're choosing the terms of the engagement here. They know exactly where they want all of these gunfights to occur, and they know that they're going to win them when they take them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and now, yeah, going into this final round of um, the half here, you we do really want to see uh, Case Western pick up uh, this round for the sake of momentum going into their attacking round. As we were saying, it doesn't really matter too much um, which side you're on here. Just uh, on coastline, it more depends on which team is winning the gunfights that they choose to take. And as we've seen so far, it's almost all the gunfights have gone in the favor of Penn State here. Yeah, and K-Bear's already in on Master, taking a lot of map control, and it's not really having and feeling any pushback from any of the roamers here. It does seem that most of these players on the second floor are stacked up inside of sight with these roamers playing a little bit more underneath. Possibly trying to get some late flanks on these staircases here. As now, K-Bear might have accidentally done a little bit of a misclick here as he throws a flashbang. Unfortunately, it will, or fortunately, it will not stun him and blind his vision. McNutt's going to go ahead and hop back onto the drone and try to find exactly where any of these flankers could be. However... As we look on the big sky cam that our observer is giving us, we are seeing that everybody is opting to stick close to home and stick close to sight. Yeah, and I think that's probably the right call here for the defense. They've Their roamers, while they're successful sometimes, have been uh, getting caught out a little bit more than they would like to. So having all of your operators hang out on site is probably going to be the most beneficial uh, choice for them here. With a minute left in the round, I imagine we're going to see a, a push come out pretty soon from PSU coming through a uh, luggage hallway here and then also onto aquarium balcony. Any players inside of aquarium right now are going to be in for a rough time in a few seconds. Yeah, and speaking of seconds, there's about 50 left in this round and everybody is still on the board. So it's definitely spelling out to be most likely a little bit of a chaotic final push. Here's some more drone work is going out as the rest of these PSA attackers are getting ready to make their execute. Some track stingers are going to get dropped, cutting a rotation as K-Bear has gone aggressive inside of Aquarium. Going to open up that angle we saw last time. Actually going to open up a full walk hole, allowing another way into sight as the Goyo Shield does block out the initial push in through the doorway. Yeah, still 5v5 with 20 seconds left. An EE1D charge coming out, not accompanied by as much of a push as I would have thought, but... K-Bear able to take out the first kill in the round. 12 seconds left. It's going to be a pretty quick push. Bomb plant going down. Legion able to take out one for himself. And now uh, Codell actually able to take out another one for himself. Pufferfish answers back immediately. And now in this post plant situation, Levent down to about one bullet of HP. Uh, Codell and Tango Mango on full HP still. This is a very doable situation for either, either side. They just have to play calm and jumpy guy actually able to take out one for himself make nut another one and now with Levent on a very low hp puffer fish boy able to take him out and uh kind of all just fell apart there there's a, a lot of gunfights that happened really fast and case western wasn't able to answer back in quite the same way that uh psa was 
Yeah, definitely MVP of that round is definitely the use of the Habana here. Opening up those holes inside of Aquarium as well as that line of sight that we just saw showcased inside of VIP really cut the site in half and there wasn't really any angles that these defenders could get into a safe location to try to fire back and take any retake any control of site once that diffuser went down we saw an absolutely dominant half coming out from Penn State Academy as they are up 5-1 and now we'll be shifting to the defensive side yeah and um with Penn State being so hot in these gunfights it doesn't look great for the side of Case Western. But going on to attack, you do get access to some stronger guns than you had on defense. So maybe that will play a factor uh, in these rounds that we're about to see. Uh, K-Bear actually switching off the Goyo onto the Bandit. Um, pretty interesting to, to six pick off of that. I do, I do think the Bandit is going to be a little bit more effective um, for them here. It doesn't seem like uh psa takes much of a slow down approach uh to their defenses as we saw in the previous map of cafe they chose to take more of those gunfights and, and roam a little bit heavier than we typically see yeah definitely with the roam we saw the six pick being stolen by k bear leaving soma to be on this caviera definitely a really interesting op that we don't get to see that much however could lead to some really in exciting gameplay if an interrogation is going to be able to get off if you are pushing solo soma might go ahead and take advantage with that caviera down you and get the interrogation off and lead your fellow attackers to be constantly pinged as to their live locations on the map yeah that would be quite something if you're able to see an interrogation come out in this this first playoff series we are going to see uh, a push come in on uh hookah balcony here from the attack pretty much uh oh, oh unfortunately we're gonna see a, a team kill come out uh from levent onto noxious leon that's really not the way you want to start your attacking round but you know it was a good shot it was a good shot <laughs> yeah definitely a good night moment here unfortunately now these case western attackers are gonna have to fight against even more adversity and now kyosoma is just sitting idly by waiting in the blue bar area trying to see if anybody might be unfortunate enough to go into Sunrise Bar and fall into his trap. However, the rest of these attackers are droning out towards Hookah Billiards as the roaming bandit is running out and getting a little bit aggressive, but he will not be pinged as he's just barely wetting his feet into the pool of the outside. Now he will be spotted out by the drone of the player above bathroom, possibly now here. But now speaking of drops, McNutt will opt to drop downstairs and join the Caviera on the first floor roam. Yeah, we saw uh, K-Bear on the Bandit handle that uh, situation where they were droned out pretty in an interesting fashion. Instead of running away, they chose to play it aggressively and hope for a follow-up drop down. But we might be able to see an interrogation come out here. Yep, uh, Keo is able to knock him down. And I think, yeah, Sledge is going to be able to get interrogated. And that's very, very unfortunate uh, for the attack of Case Western. So now these red squares that you see above the attackers is exactly what the rest of the defenders are going to see as that beautiful interrogation does go off. And that is a quite rare play that unfortunately I have not been able to cast thus far until just now. McNutt's going to take quite advantage of that and take Tango Mango down with essentially illegal wall hacks at this point. As now Kyo is just sitting in an aggressive situation trying to get another interrogation off to feed even more intel to his team but Codell and Consuela are not there but Kaber will finally get that run out onto Codell here and leave the rest of this round up to Tim the Consuela sitting on Aqua Balcony. And yeah Tim the Consuela actually able to get taken down pretty quickly from uh, McNutt over inside of that luggage hallway through that window. Um, they did have the intel on uh, Keo. very unfortunate position to be in. Um, couldn't really do too much in that situation except Try to fight for your life, maybe get one one or two kills. Yeah, once you get interrogated, it's definitely a very difficult situation to climb back from, especially when you have to also do the climbing back of being at a 4v5 disadvantage due to an unfortunate team kill. But we are seeing Kyosoma just stick that caviar once again, flexing his comfort on this map as he's just going to flash in and out into sort of scary positions where you don't want to meet this Caviera one-on-one. -on -one. 
We're also seeing Goyo being brought by K-Bear. Once again, as these Goyo shields of the Vulcan variety are definitely very powerful in their ability to deny entry and cause a lot of damage if you're unfortunate enough to be standing next to one when it goes off. Yeah, now with um, PSA over here on match point, they're move down to the kitchen site. And like you were saying, the cab being brought out again is a, a pretty good example of, you know, if you got it, flaunt it. Like, Keo is, he's doing really well for himself and he's, he's I would say almost every player uh, on PSA is, is really feeling themselves uh, for the majority of this series so far. And they're choosing to take a lot more aggressive gunfights, which sometimes ends up being to uh, the detriment of the team that does that. But with Case Western really not being able to answer at all. Uh, yeah, highlighted by our observer here, we are going to see a very interesting Goyo shield setup, with all three being placed um, right inside of that uh, end office entryway. Which you know is a, a pretty typical place for a push to come from, but it does not seem like we're going to see a push from that side on this round. I think though that Goyo placement definitely shows really well into the sort of synergy that you can have with a Maestro and Goyo combination, as that Maestro Evil Eye camera will be able to just go ahead and zap out the Goyo shields and blow them up from a safe distance, as opposed to a, a defender having to peek and get those shots onto the big red targets of those shields. Kyo is sitting in a very, very sneaky position, hidden underneath a desk inside of office area. As Tim is going to go ahead and use his shotgun master key here to open up the aqua door, and he has a little bit of a line of sight to exactly where McNutt is sitting on top of white stairs. Yeah, it does see that window's broken out. Unfortunately, not able to react in time to get that to click onto his head there. Uh, gonna take this fight over back into luggage, makes his way through over and behind Aquarium Bar. K-Bear takes out one for himself. K-Bear gets a second one onto that buck that was playing behind Aquarium Bar here. K-Bear able to get a third for himself, and unfortunately the, the Reign of Terror ends there uh, with Codell taking him out. But Codell quickly refragged by McNutt, and now a 4v1 situation. It's all down to Tango Mango down with that black beard. No drones left, not a lot of intel and gets taken out by Kiyosoma, and, and that's it. That's that's the series. PSA takes it over Case Western, and they will move on to play uh, our number two seed, Grand Canyon University, uh, in the round of 32. And that will be next week, but you need to stay tuned for the rest of this week, as there's going to be a couple more round of 36 teams duking it out, trying to find their way into the main bracket. And it is my joy to say we will be having an interview. So we are going to get to see one of these Penn State Academy players come in. And we're going to get to pick their brains a little bit on exactly what was going on behind the scenes. to get a little bit of intel in on their comms and understand exactly what was going on for their team. Yeah, I'm very interested to, to ask them about their decision to keep their attacks as aggressive as they had. Um, Typically, it doesn't. You don't see that work out uh, consistently for a lot of attacks. Uh, usually, a, a very aggressive push will be met by a very solitary defense that uh, kind of holds up and, and is able to rebound and respond to that aggressive push. But we did not see that uh, in this series at all. So, it, yeah, it, it's very interesting to to look at how how uh, PSA was. They understood their advantages and they really, really pushed every single one they could. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing was that final roam we saw was making use of that little dual roam that we would like to talk about. They were within five seconds of each other and they were able to set up their refrags. Even though that Goyo was able to get a whole lot of picks with that TCSG, he was ultimately fallen down, but the Jaeger was right there to get that final refrag and they did come out on top when the trades started flying out. Yeah, that was something that cannot be understated, the importance of uh, the refragging potential uh, that came, that we did see from Penn State. No matter what happened, if they lost a gunfight, there was always someone there to refrag and, and take back uh, the advantage or at least even up the, the rounds again. So now we are going to get to see Jumpy Guy coming in, and congratulations. How are you doing tonight, Jumpy Guy? Thank you. I'm doing great. So, Bagel, do you want to go ahead and take the lead on this one? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about 
I thought it was very interesting how you guys were able to push your very aggressive attacks. I just want to, if you could enlighten us a little bit about why you continually uh, were so, so aggressive on those attacks throughout the series. Uh, so our main thing is we droned it out. Uh, they didn't really bring out any mutes or uh, mozzies. So we were able to pretty freely drone site and see what they had. So knowing that information, we just kind of were easily able to get in, take what we want, and covered angles, blew stuff up, won. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's about it. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely exactly what we saw here. As your room clear was just so clean on coastline especially, you did take a 5-1 lead on that. Was there any sort of confidence as you guys pushed in on that 5-1 lead as you pushed towards defense? I know we saw a Caviera pick. Was that sort of a product of overconfidence, possibly? Uh, no, he just really likes playing Cav. Oh, fair enough. Here, so I guess we do have to say that you did win your first map pick. However, Coastline was the map pick of Case Western. Did that make you guys feel really comfortable in how you guys did map picks? Did you almost feel like you won off yeah. of map picks? Yeah. Pretty much felt that. Definitely really good. So going forward, you are going to have to go ahead and face GCU in the round of 32. Is there any sort of extra preparation you guys are going to have to do? Because I know they are a very strong team. Uh, we're just going to keep playing our game, playing together. See where it goes. All righty. Do you have anything else to say, Bagel? No, I think we, we covered about it. You push your advantages when you needed to and pay it off for you. Thank you. I, I think my final thing to say is I, I, I saw a little bit in chat that there was a bit of a rumor with K-Bear and Habana. Is there anything you can say about that? Shine a light on that situation? Oh? What do you mean? Oh, I saw somebody was saying that there'd be a Habana cosplay coming out if this <laughs> game was won by K-Bear. <laughs> I, I might have to hold him to that. We'll see. Alrighty, so we can go ahead and wrap up. This was our first round of 36 games, and we definitely want to say a big old thanks to our sponsors here, as our biggest sponsor being Corsair. If you need any peripherals or any sort of computer parts, they offer really wonderful products, as well as they have joined our team, helped us with the prize pool, and helped doing a lot of giveaways with us. In addition to Corsair, What's New.gg has helped us launch our own CEA merch. If you've been tinkering around inside our Discord, you saw that these announcements recently were the end of the giveaway for this new CEA merch. So if you were lucky enough to be selected in that giveaway, you need to check your DM soon as more information will go out, as well as if you still want to get some of those beautiful mouse pads, the joggers, the wall scroll, or that amazing dad hat, you can go ahead and go onto the website at CEA Siege, and there is a new tab with shop that will link you straight to what's new.gg's CEA store. And finally, we do have Rogue Energy who have been with us for quite a while and have helped us with our production here. So if you go ahead and go to Rogue Energy and get any of their energy supplement, if you use code CEA at checkout, you will get 10% off. So I've been Seed Apps. And I've been Bagel. And we'd like to wish you a good night.